Justin, are, are you with us? I am with you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to have you. Where Where are you? Where are you calling from tonight? I am in uh, New Jersey tonight. We've been we've been on, on tour all summer. We're play, going to mid September, and we're playing tomorrow night uh, at Fastlands in Asbury Park. Oh, great! So, uh, they fixed it up down there so now. It's pretty nice. I've heard. Yeah, it's been another, another sold out show. It's going to be great. It's so funny. You remember November the fourth, nineteen sixty three. Now I know where it was. I was in. I'm from a big Catholic family, and we were allowed to watch that uh, Beatles performance on November the 4th, 1963, oh. and I would have been six years old. <laughs> and my parents, who are not rock and rollers, let us watch that song, and then should they turned over to a, well, the other channel that was available in England at the time. So incredible. Yeah. So we actually have someone, good evening, it's Dennis Elsis. We actually have someone hey, who saw that performance. I, yeah. I, I love that. I remember it well. And where, where are you? In, in England in, in, in that year? Well, I'm from Wales, so I'm from a place that I'm, your audience might not be familiar with Wales. Tom Jones is from Wales. Oh, we know, we, we, we're aware of the, of the we'll okay, call it a country. Okay. Of course. <laughs> so you were in Wales? And, uh, in Wales, as a six-year-old kid, my twin brother, um, five other brothers, and a sister. Um, we would all be around the TV watching that, because obviously the the hype must have been enormous. We did so much of the Beatles on the radio. We knew all their songs. We didn't know any of the records. We didn't know they had a record player. But on the radio, you could hear them all the time. And it was a big, big moment to be on the, the Royal Variety Show from the Palladium. It was a big show. Obviously, the Queen was there. And uh, they just looked, I mean, I can imagine being a six year old, they just looked remarkable. These silhouettes, you know, all in black, and uh, it took on black and white TV. And it was uh, just the, the energy of Leonard's voice. It just you know, even at a young age, it just it's natural. It wasn't didn't blow me off the stage. It's just this is just a natural thing to us. It was a uh, we weren't old enough to understand what was going on, but we knew it, it was just the language of music to us. But listening to, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, our singers, the three of them, they're all so influential on all of us. And even listening to Desire, then I can hear McCartney in it. You can hear so McCartney weird, in your own vocal. Yeah. In my own voice, I can hear McCartney. Well, oh, okay, you know, let, 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 let's 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 talk about that. What what did because it isn't something that's that jumps out of the speakers it's not like hearing bad finger or something what did you no. get from paul mccartney as a singer that you incorporated into Gino's jezebel just just his effortless way i mean i don't know where he gets it from you know the way he can sing something else help skelter or ag and just drop up and down and screech those vocal cords and yet come back down to a beautiful pure notes as if it's nothing's happened you know he's it's unbelievable. Have you ever seen that thing where he's rehearsing with wings for the third time? It's on YouTube. Oh, yeah. My bass player is a huge, huge McCartney fan. You know, it's just their own Ram, and he works from Ram backwards. You know, and it was like you watch it, and Danny Lane is singing. And Danny Lane's a good singer, mm -hmm. but you see McCartney goes to the mic, and he's showing, he's showing you he's the king. <laughs> he's an incredible singer. I mean, it's. Well, I, I, I remember an article in The New Yorker a few years ago about the Beatles, and I can't remember who wrote it. I, I, should, I should find out. But uh, it made a great point. It said the most remarkable thing of all the remarkable things that had to happen for the Beatles to happen was that the two best songwriters of their generation would not just be born in the same neighborhood at the same time, right. but would also be the two best singers of their generation. And I think, I, isn't it? I think that's the thing people incredible. don't think about enough, is that if they hadn't been able to sing like they did, then all the rest of the talent would not have, have burst through the What center. they had to overcome in those days to get a record contract, I mean, look how popular they were in, 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 in the north of England, and they couldn't get arrested. They ended up, I mean, you probably discussed it before, Parlophone was a comedy label. Right, right. All the acts on Parlophone were all light, lightweight uh, British comedians. Everybody had turned them down. Uh, Everybody had turned them down. Everybody turned them down. And Everybody. if Brian Epstein's family had not ordered a lot of records from the record company, he never would have gotten his foot in the door to begin with. It was just... It was... Incredible. But, yeah, it? but you it's know, that brings up... They changed everything. They changed yeah. everything, Jay. That's why the three of us have jobs here today. And you too, for that matter. But... You know, oh, but, but something that, that, I, that I wonder about, and you just touched on it, is they, there's the famous 10,000 hours or, or whatever the number is. You know, yeah. the, the Beatles, yeah. by the time we saw the Beatles, they had put in so much work. They had done so many gigs. They had played so many shows and so, learned so many songs. And they had worked out whatever wasn't going to work in the band. Some of the Quarrymen and Stu Sutcliffe and, and Pete Best had all been 
moved aside. Yeah. And, it, you know, it was John, Paul, George, and Ringo. It was the finished unit when the world met them. And a group like yours, and this was true of a lot of groups in the early 80s, especially in the UK, you kind of got signed when you were still pretty new at it. You know? oh, uh, I mean, yeah. do you ever wish that you had I, had not had to grow up in public, that you had had that time off I've in a always, Hamburg or something? I've always said that. Yeah. I've always said to people, you know, um, because yeah, I literally had a plan. I, I was hitching around Europe and stuff. And I said, oh, i got to get back to England. I can sing. I can write songs. i got to go back to Wales, get a band together, and then we'll move to London, get a record deal, and get an agent. And uh, all those things happened. The only problem was we weren't actually, uh, you know, as you say, we were, we were not ready for the public yet. <laughs> right. you know, that was the problem there. In the 80s, you could literally form a band and put a video out, and you have a hit single. And it's, uh, it's, it's you know, all the bands I like, you know, from, from the 60s and 70s, they put their work in, you know, and uh, you could hear it on the records and you could see them live and they just blow you away. Standards are very high. I mean, there was, you know, that, that was the beauty of the 80s and how quick it happened and also the, what was the floor of the 80s. A lot of bands weren't ready. A lot of bands weren't even that talented as well, let's face it. I always think, um, I always think it's, it's always a drag when you go to see somebody now and you go like, well, now he's great. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like yeah, yeah. At, at the moment of the big hype and the big record release and the showcase and all the money, he wasn't ready, but now he's he's figured it out. Uh, but uh, I also want to know... Pa Graham Parker. Oh, sorry. Graham Parker. Well, Graham Parker was pretty yeah, good. He, with. Yeah, but he, but he said it stuff. He said, yeah, we were pretty good when we when we, stuck, when we were there in the, in the late 70s. But he said, we're so much better now. No one, no one comes. <laughs> yeah. It's so ironic. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned coming from hey. Wales, and I want to I want to talk about that a little bit because, as the Beatles came from Liverpool, as the Hollies and Oasis came from Manchester, as as Van Morrison and them came from Belfast, we know that people in London tend to be a little snobby, a little parochial, tend to mm. look down on people who come who are not from London. Absolutely. Yeah. Did, did, oh, that was true in the eighties. I, I know it was. I mean, did it take mm -hmm. you guys a while to... I mean, was it good for you because it brought you closer together or was it bad because you didn't feel like you were in the club? Well, the thing was, because of the Beatles weird in that thing, you, you were aware that if you stuck together, you could, you could, there was a chance you could conquer anything. One of the things that shocked me when I came to LA was these musicians, they'd be in 10 bands. <laughs> yeah. you know, whereas all the other Brits bands would all be the stuff against the world kind of vibe. So, yeah, we did coming to London we did feel that is, uh, there was uh, you know the people were uh, oh my god they're from Wales we were very parochial as you said and you have to fight it yeah and even the BBC it took a while to play us a long time to play our songs and we ended up you know coming to Europe and America before where we made much greater headway than we did in England we had to come back as a lot of bands did you know go to come to America first that's interesting so uh, it's bizarre yeah now, now something I, 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 I now, got it you think it's changing now I think so, because you see a lot more, you know, people from the north and Scotland and Wales on, on British television, uh, much more, it's much more represented than it used to be, for sure. Well, it used to be that, uh, I mean, I know this is a long time gone now, but if you didn't have that BBC accent, if you didn't look like oh. you came from a boarding school or something, then uh, uh, you, you were supposed to be a comedian. Really I know. But look at, look at that, I mean, we don't want to get political, but look what's happening in Britain right now. We're being run by the same same people. Same people went to the same class, the same university, the same school. At least they got a Beatles haircut now. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so yeah, so, I mean they they changed that. I mean, uh, I mean, how they made it, I don't know. When you think about it, the things against them were so incredible. But as you said, it was a magical how it all came together, all the artwork, all the great photographers, the, everything came together for the Beatles. I just wish they'd stayed together for the, in the 70s. Who knows what they would have created? It would have been unbelievable if they could, like, band could have stayed together. They'd left the stones in their, in their way behind them, you know? We're talking with... You know, I'm sorry, did you have... I, I, I wanted to let everybody... No, no, no. I wanted to let everybody no, no, know no. who they're listening to. We're talking with Jay Aston. Uh, of Gene Loves Jezebel. Two, one question I've thought about for a long time. Tonight I get the answer. Gene Loves Jezebel, which is such a memorable name, does that, does that really come from a, a, um, a song from way back when? Is that, a, is that uh, Gene? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, actually. 
that's Wikipedia's inaccuracy that somewhere else has written. I'll tell you where the name came tell from. Tell us where the name came from. We're going to get on Wikipedia this, tonight this, and fix this, it. This is a major Beatles connection. We went to London in 1980. We all know what, what happened in 1980. But I was a big fan of uh, Lennon's rock and roll album. Ronald Alby did a Gene Vincent song, Bebop Alula. And I had to get a band name uh, for this art event. Well, we didn't have a name yet. And I thought, oh, Gene Vincent, so cool. I, I love Lennon's uh, version of it. And I thought, now, Gene, some, someone called me Jezebel. That's another long story. They, they just got my <laughs> name wrong. They called me Jezebel. And I literally, on the spur of the moment, I thought, I know Gene loves Jezebel. Gene Vincent loves Jezebel. So I got, you know, John Lennon's rock and roll album to fit. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, we appreciate uh, I mean, finding Beatles connections where we didn't know they existed. Great. We never knew that. We're here for the it's world. It's unbelievable. I mean, I mean Lennon was a I mean, what a, an icon, what a, a figure, you know. Um, I mean, um, we do a little acoustic thing for the fans uh, with Mike Peters and our friends Modern English before our gigs. And Mike and I did uh, Wooden Class Hero together. And Mike does a great Lennon. And he, you just feel he's, he's, he's in Lennon's inhabited. <laughs> he's great. So, so, so Mike Peters and other Welshmen, oh, I yeah. might add, he does, oh, Lennon, he does Lennon and you do McCartney? He's a, he's a great rhythm player as well, you know. He really is. You know, I can do a bit of both. He's got that piercing. Voice. Now, now Jay, we're talking to Jay Aspen of uh, Jay Aston, sorry, of Gene Loves Jezebel, and, and something that uh, this can't be right, but it's been handed to me. You met George Martin while working in the Apple Store. Were you actually? Is that true? I know. Isn't that weird connection to Apple? Isn't that so weird? Yeah, the Apple Store. You know, I know people know the story of Apple where, where the Beatles are suing them. So sue me is one of those sounds on the Apple thing. No, it's, it's a long story. I, I got into legal problems. My brother was using the name over here. That's why we're called Jay Aston's Gene Loves Jezebel. Now, even though we're the original band, okay. uh, and so I, I actually I was in debt through legal fees, you know, American legal fees are like. And so I got a job at Apple. They opened a store in in London, a big store, and they I, they took me on. One of the first few people they took on, just to work in the theatre, where I kept help teach people music uh, software, and play songs, and show them how to work Macs. And we used to have events where people like REM would come in. And artists would come in, and one night, there's a, I've forgotten the artist's name, it'll be in my diary, I keep diaries, you know, journals. Uh, and George Martin was there to, just to talk about his friend who, who had a little installation he was showing, which uh, they were doing a thing on. And I was in the theatre, and I'd introduce people, you know, this is, you know, George or there. And I, I've never approached famous people, especially people I look up to. And George Martin, to me, is someone that I can't believe, can't believe on the same planet as him, you know. And, a friend of mine who worked at Abbey Road, and I've been in Studio Two, by the way, he said to me, come on, Jay, come and meet George, and he just pulled me over, and I met him, and what a wonderful man. Incredibly lovely man with his wife, and uh, just plenty of time for you, and just chatting, and I just remember his shoes, you know, he just, his shoes, he's a man that uh, didn't just wear new things all the time, he obviously loved his shoes, and he'd obviously resold them several times, because they were old and well-worn in them. Uh, a man who went to the cobbler experience. got his shoes fixed. <laughs> yeah, somebody who knew the valleys from that time in the, when the Beatles came from. You know, that was very post-war England, a very dark black and white time. They all talked about dismal, you know, and they just exploded. And uh, so he'd never forgot those valleys. He's probably always through them, you know, and you, you, I don't think you forget those things. Do you know the valley of a good pair of shoes? <laughs> Jay asked him, Gene loves Jezebel. Now, you were on tour with your mates, you, as you discussed it, uh, The Alarm and Modern English. And I'm guessing at some point, d did you play with these bands at another time? Did Gene loves Jezebel? Yeah. Either? Yeah, we did. We did very early on. When we first went to London, we, we played on a, on a bill with Modern English. Uh, they were on a label called 4AD, uh, which was a sister label. We were on it on Beggars. It's a label. The Beggars Group's very big now. They have Adele and all these kind of people on it. But back then, it was a smaller label, a lot, a lot of independent bands. Uh, so we played an early gig with them. And I, even when I remember being with Ivo Russell Watts, who ran 4AD, and he sounds bands like Bauhaus, uh, Birthday Party, and those kind of bands. And him, him saying to me, because I think we used to chat about music all the time, but uh, and he said to me about, all about modern English in the studio, and Hugh Jones, the producer, wants some more money. And they were doing a song about Milk With You, which he hadn't heard yet. 
and he was worried about spending more money in the studio. I think he got his money back. <laughs> yeah, really. I'll, I'll say. And this is this is quite a tour. You, you're at Asbury Park. You're at Asbury Lanes tomorrow, and then off to a theater in Staten Island called St. George, and then off to yep. uh, Norfolk and Charlotte and Atlanta and Orlando and so on and so forth. Where can folks keep up with your current uh, musical projects and the uh, the dates on this tour if they want to catch it? Do you have a particular website? Well, most people like to go to, most people like to, go to Facebook, so it's uh, Gene Loves Jezebel with Jay Aston on Facebook. Okay. Or you can go to GeneLovesJezebel.co.uk, which is the, the, the British, we're all from Britain. So the GeneLovesJezebel.com represents my brother, which is not the real band race. So, um, you're, you're identical yeah. twin brother. I mean, I don't want to get off on that, mm-hmm. but the fact that identical yeah. twins are both running Gene Loves Jezebels is, well, this is a story mm-hmm. for another time. What I really want to know it's about before, <laughs> before we let you go, Jay, is is it true you once almost crashed into Ringo's car? This is absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, we were on, not Wikipedia, this, you know, false. Go this, ahead. This, t- tell us the story. Yeah, it's probably about 1986, maybe 87. I think it's about 86. But with, uh, people might be familiar with London. Uh, it's a place called Walton Street. It's kind of yeah, parallel yeah. The, to Fulham, Fulham Road and uh, uh, Bromson Road. Yep. And we just drive down there with my manager, lives in Chelsea, and I live in Old Court on Old Bromson Road. She's probably giving me a ride home. And we're pulling out the side street, and in front of us, uh, pulling out too quickly, is Ringo Starr with Barbara Bach in, in the car. And we all would hit them. And my, my manager just about break the time. And I said, man, that's not, I, I said, I do not want to be remembered from, you know, for bulldozing. Oh, uh, well, that Star. would be the worst way to meet Beatle. Can you imagine? Oh, man. <laughs> it's like, hey, listen, I'm a really big fan. I got a band. Oh, I got a God. tape here for you. <laughs> that would have been bad, really bad. And another surreal thing as well, uh, around the time of Live H, remember that thing, the Bob Gilder? Uh, I, I was there. I was there. Oh, you were there? Well, yep. the day before, McCarthy must have been rehearsing, and I used to live in Maida Vale, you know, it's yep. a beautiful area. If anyone's in London, they should visit it and uh, stroll up to uh, up to Abbey Road. But I was just strolling, as I do, because I walk a lot. I walk 15, 20 miles most days, if I can, because I just love you walk 15 or 20 miles I was on one of, good for you. Yeah, sometimes 30, uh, but 20 is about fun for me. But I have a lot of energy, I don't know, to do that. That's why I'm in a band, I guess. I, I don't stop moving. But I was just walking to college, down in Mews, I should be there, but Paul McCartney. Just drive on me walking one side, him walking the other. I did not say anything, didn't look at him, didn't want to bother him, you know, but it was just incredible to be that kid of six years old watching one TV, looking through your whole life, all the people's stuff, all the stuff we have for Christmas, like guitars with people's faces on. You know, Iron Filing used to be a magnet to put their people's <laughs> haircuts on. Yeah, I actually you know, remember that. I forgot about that. that. story you told earlier about the band and the inspiration for the name and uh and and gene vincent and 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 the the uh, the john lennon cover of the gene vincent song so uh we quickly pulled that song out and we are going to close our segment as we say good night to uh jay oh, of gene loves jezebel on tour currently with the alarm and modern english and they are touring quite a bit so a lot of opportunities to see them so you are the DJ. You will introduce the song. We had a delightful time with you this evening, and we thank you so much for be, being part of our show. You're on. Okay, John Lennon. Beep, bop, <laughs> 